And here we go. We're live. Hi to everyone watching. Welcome to our live stream. Another Let's Practice. Today we're looking at Haydn, the Sonata in C major, Hoboken 50. One of the more, uh, let's say, uh, I think it's really one of the most uh, famous of Haydn sonatas. Uh, one of the most beautiful amongst many. So many of them are amazing. Haydn is really an incredible composer. So for everyone who doesn't know Haydn, I really encourage you to like check him out. Um, maybe a personal thing. I love Mozart. You know, I love Beethoven. Uh, but Haydn is like Haydn has a special place in in my heart and the heart of a lot of um, a lot of pianists, I think. So uh, here it is, the Sonata in C major. Uh, we're going to look at so much we can look at. So, you know, I think we're just going to have fun with this. If you guys want to throw some specific questions in the chat, go ahead. Uh, you know, I'll try not to go. I think I'll try not to go too much in detail because I could probably spend three hours on this sonata. So I'll try to keep it interesting as much as possible. And what else? Haydn. You know, Haydn is the father of the symphony. The symphony is, is a creation of Haydn. So he started this thing as well as string trios and, and so many things in music. So, so Haydn is a really important uh, person in music that I think sometimes a lot, uh, a lot of the times, I'm not sure. You guys let me know in the, in the chat, you know, but I feel like Hi Haydn is a little bit uh, overshadowed by Mozart for the general uh, population. You know, people will, will know a lot about Mozart, but maybe not necessarily so that's it. Hi, Bill. Hi, everyone who's watching. And uh, here we go. We're going to start this. Uh, I play it for you. So here we go. The Sonata in C major. This is really fun. This is really fun.
Sonata, hi Martina. So, all right, let's get in. Let's, <laughs> had to play that one through. I haven't played it in a while though. Okay, so I'd like to talk about, you know, of course, articulations. Try not to talk about fingering, but it's so hard not to because it ties into everything else that we talk about. And of course, I want to go into a little bit the shapes and the forces of gravity that we have in this music. And of course, the structure and everything else. So, let's dive into this wonderful piece in C major a little bit here. It's going to be a little more, a little less, a little more, and a little less again. So this one more, and this one less. This one more, and this one less. So many little interesting things in classical music. It's like little small things put together compared to romantic music is like one big huge thing so you have you need you need and again in within a crescendo so all these little things you need you need there's something very spontaneous about it too you know that's what we have in this classical music is instead of instead of playing it like this would be a, a really romantic way which doesn't feel very spontaneous. Now the classical speaking way where every note is important, it's like there should be a little breath in between every every little thing that we have there. So that's kind of normal, right? Then we really have a classical feel to it. Right? These beautiful C major chords. C, G, C. Short, short, short. I think maybe a lot of people make that kind of mistake. They go, or they do this. So keep them exactly the way they're written. By the way, I like to use, especially with Haydn, the Wiener Urtext uh, Schoke Universal Edition. I think this is the best uh, for Haydn. And, uh, and I have a photocopy here because I just have so many things written in the score. So. Yeah, short, short, short. That's a bit of a challenge, yeah? All those little things. So, little wheel here, three notes in a wheel, and then ti da dum ti bum rotation. So look now, let's look at the, the forces of gravity here a little bit. And the left hand, we have uh, D, C, D, C, da, da, da. So listen to this line. Yeah, da, 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 da. We have this. Yeah, da, 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 da. And then we have one going up like this. Yeah, da, 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 da. So I don't know which videos I've, I've explained this in, but when you look at the forces of gravity, you have to look at the curves in the music, the way it the way the lines rise up and rise down, kind of like scales, right? But they have curves to them. Sometimes, you know, they go down, whoop, and then they start to go up. So when you show the forces of gravity, it's kind of, 
you know, in music, we call the centrifugal force. Centrifugal force is, uh, is, you know, when you turn on a blender, everything whoosh, sticks to the sides. Actually, it might be, might be something opposite from centrifugal force. I'm not sure, but that gives you the idea of this thing that goes whoom, right? Or you think of when you're in a car and you're on a, you're on a hill and you drive down, it goes yum, you feel the forces of gravity. And same thing when you go, when you go down, then you feel a little weightless, right? And then you feel like the gravity kick in. And same thing when you're at the bottom of a hill and you start going up, you feel that, you feel the, the gravity, right? Haydn didn't have cars, but you know, when you're in your horse carriage or whatever. <laughs> so, so we have that in music and you show it by showing, showing the, where the curve is, but it's a little bit after the curve. So you put, you do a little, um, a little, uh, off the map, trying to find the English word, a little, uh, swell towards a little bit after the curve. You know, if you take your whole scale and you divide it into four pieces, well, right where the second piece starts, that's usually the sweet spot, right? So let's see here. Sometimes it coincides with the beat. Like in this case. So see, we have one that's right on the beat. And now one that's really off the beat. So see that? I don't know how clear that is, but I'm, I'm going to keep talking about this, so I think eventually you might get it. So you see that? And that's sometimes that little sweet spot. It might be two notes or in between two notes. You know, like in this case, we could say it's the D. Or it's kind of between the D and the E. It doesn't matter. We don't have to go. It could be. Right? Now that's just personal. I've always played it this way. I don't know why. But it's actually. I can't do it differently. I've played it for too many times. Now this is kind of like a silly conversation, really. We have, and then, and then again. So he, this one, the, and let's four, and again. Crescendo. And all in that, yup, yup. See, that's really nice when you have two notes that are the same, one after another. Usually one is more important. Often the second one falls falls off of it. So see, yup, not, not the same. Same thing. See how that second, the last note is a little softer. That's great. Now start soft again. Crescendo. This is a fun fingering, you know. I used to do this like this five, four, three, five, four, three, two. And then, you know, someone gave me the idea to do this four, one everywhere. And I, I like that. So, this is the way that Haydn is a little bit witty, right? Now this time, something a little different. Again, we have that force of gravity. See on the D. We could go into articulation a lot also here, you know. So these things are often like also answers in conversations, you know, uh, very much like in Mozart. Like a, a response to that. Now, I love this because here, <clears throat> up to now, we've been in C major. 
we haven't really had a modulating bridge. Because this really feels like the dominant, right? G. We're ready to go back, right back to C major. But then all of a sudden we're in G major. Yeah. Look at the curves again. You see that? Okay, if we don't show the curves, maybe you do crescendo to the highest note. Right? Much less in interesting than putting it somewhere in between, somewhere around the beginning. So see now we show those curves. say it's also the F sharp and the E, maybe all the way to the D. What level do you need to be to play this sonata? It seems challenging. You don't have to play it so fast, you know. It, it sounds very nice, a little bit slower than we're playing it now. You know, we'd have, it's, it's really different. We'd have to get into that. And, I, and you know, when you put a metronome on these and you get the rhythm exactly pure in these things, it's really satisfying, even at a not too fast tempo. So this could be... Yum, 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 two and three and four and one and one. So, you know, let's say a, an early advanced student could play it. But it's, you know, it's an advanced piece. <laughs> Finger four three two one four three two one four three two one and these from the keys up. Yep. Ah, that's annoying. <laughs> that's it. Four four two. Well, let's do from up down. Two four one three two four. the articulations, you know, it's so much more interesting to play it that way than so you have yep. You hear the difference in the articulation. This one is short, yep. And then in the left hand, yep. And the other thing we have here is again Come back to curves. I think that's really the thematic of this video. You show that change. Right? All right. All right. Here I like to put five one four two everywhere, except for this one. That's the tough part. You can put one five, one four, three five, four two, and then go back to the other finger. There's a, there's other ways of doing it, but you know, if you do that, it's not very good. So you now we get into something a little more mm, melodramatic, melancholic. to these 
these things, wherever you have notes that are tied, listen to really how the new chord sounds with the tied note. So here is B flat. You hear that? A little bit like we were doing in the Claire de Lune. You hear that? Where it's tied. Try to keep it in tempo. I think everyone slows down here. We have little rolls. That's another kind of dialogue, right? Uh, so we have this. And then an F. And then again. And again, we try to feel those forces of gravity. I mean, really what we should go into more when we're talking about forces of gravity is is the technique, you know, how to connect this all in the body because the forces are not just something that you do, you play, it's something you feel and then they come out in the music and there's a way of, of doing that. So if you haven't checked out the video uh, about the lower body technique, playing with the lower body, best technique video you never saw, something like that, check that out, you know, that's, that's really good to have that kind of connection. For something like this, <laughs> Everything that we're doing, it's really when you feel this in your center of gravity. I don't know if any of you are into chakras, okay? The second chakra or just physical anatomy, you know, but that part of your body, when you feel these, it's it's a center of gravity, right? So they'll teach you that in, in, in a lot of sports or martial arts that, you know, when the movement starts from this place in the body, it's very powerful, right? So whether it's a powerful thing we're going with the playing or, or not, that's very useful to us, right? Like this, you you feel that. It's different than artificially creating it with the fingers. I call that artificial, right? Compared to because it's so different. So here we're at this. Forces of gravity, centrifugal force. It's like something goes, whoom. That's what that's what we're looking for. Yeah, that is a little tough. So yeah, don't rush here. Maybe some people rush here. And again, our little force. Again, there's our little line, right? So you'd place the other, the second group of three in the right hand. This is nice if you go in decrescendo. So that last G is pretty soft. Same thing at the end of the piece. Right? You can also have... Feel the left hand. Just feel that left hand. Yes, we did get the piano tune, John. Thank you for that. We did get the piano tune. Twice. So... Again, those forces of gravity... Try this out, especially in your classical music, but in the romantic music, it's the same thing. It's just that usually the scales are much longer, right? So instead of you have things like that, right? So you see, we're not going to the end. We're not starting from uh, from the beginning, and we're not going. It's somewhere where the curve begins, you know, after the curve has begun. In this case, on the third beat. So.
while we're talking about forces of nature and centrifugal force and all that, it's an important thing to consider that also Haydn in his time, you know, and for, for many artists, well, even I would say like the majority of artists, if not all of them at the time, where do they get their inspiration from? It's, you know, God and nature mainly. And nature is kind of like God as well in a way, right? So, so these forces of gravity, they're things that exist in nature. So the inspiration of the music comes a lot of there. And the concept of a personal expression isn't, isn't very developed as far as music is concerned. Music, you know, in the Renaissance era is always this thing. It's inspired from God or it's inspired by nature and that's it. And now, you know, Beethoven later, and this is a late Haydn, so it's almost, you know, uh, <laughs> the most romantic Haydn we're going to get compared to early Haydn. But yes, Beethoven's really going to open the door of this personal expression in the music. So that's, you know, this, these forces of nature, it's a big thing that they had to go by. You know, it's, they didn't have much, much other than that at the time. Right? So that's really important. So all that to say, Haydn knows this. He's writing these notes for that reason, so they can be played that way. That's a very interesting thing to think about. These are just natural things that people feel as far as, you know, the forces of nature and gravity is. So here, try to decrescendo this. See how everything is shaped. You might go, or you might go a little softer on the last go. So it goes ta da 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 instead of da 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 da. Right? That's a different way of doing it. dimension to it yada da 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 yada da 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 that's actually it i don't quite have it yet because you should have that one yada da Isn't that wonderful? We just start out with our theme in minor. Now we're you have this A major, yum, D minor, dominant of D minor, right? And in the right hand, so we'll have those shapes, right? We also have short, short, uh, we have an eighth note, an eighth note, and a quarter note. So you can pay attention to that, even if they have the little staccatos. Same thing in the right hand, short, short, less short. Now we have this three times. Right, we have in the right hand, left hand here. Then a uh, middle voice. So F major. Right, isn't that exciting? again in our curve or I just like to show the curve honestly and 
this one more and this one less, just like we did in the beginning of the piece. Remember? And a little more and a little less. A little more and a little less. Same thing. trill uh, can you just be specific about about the trill so i know which one it is uh bill says can you briefly talk about playing classical versus romantic music where you classical and study each note great yeah good question i think we've already started to touch on that a little bit um, uh, thank you for talking about this piece hi jacob hi Piotr. um i had some trouble with the double thirds in the right hand Okay, so is that like the, uh, these things, or you guys just try to be specific when you when you ask the question, so I can help you the best. You know, is that this? I just don't know where you're talking about. So if you can uh, just elaborate there, we'll we'll get into that for sure. time we've had the theme in F major. We had C major, then we had G major, and now we had G minor, and now we have F major, with the octaves in the bass, and so the first one more, again, Here's our here's a little shape we want to show on the second beat here. Sforzando here and then I remember I remember playing this for my teacher years ago and a little like this. And he wanted me to play like this. asking me to feel this, feel the tension in your legs, in your thighs. I don't know if the thighs is exactly the right place, but see how you connect that? It makes the, it puts the tension in the music. It's easy to stretch things and, and express things rather than this being separate from everything you're doing with your arms and your hands. No. This is important. So again, check out the video with the, the lower body technique. So here's an idea. Here the problem is it's dying down, dying down, diminuendo, piano, and then there's there's not enough room to go. Yeah, so we need a few crescendos in here. This can be a little less and then again. Then here to come back to here. Piano. But sustain a little bit so it's not too soft here. Same thing here. Ideally, it would be nice to go. But we don't really have anywhere to go left. So it's a little dangerous to get too soft too soon here. Just, uh, you know. Be, uh, be conscientious about that, you know? Um, measures, just the first few measures. B, A, G sharp, G. This stuff? The, we're talking about these ones. Yeah, let's look at a fingering a little bit. Uh, you can do four, three, two. Okay. Oh, these, I see. Uh, these ones, okay. All right, so you could do four, three, two, three, one. Four, three, two, three, one. Another one you can do is four, three, two, four, one. I don't use that. It's not bad, though. I'm probably more, more precise with that. I don't know, I think it's also more interesting. When I put the four, it's more interesting. But I usually don't. 
Uh, same thing here. So yeah, for sure, that's a challenge, right? That's a challenge for any any pianist. Also with the fast four, three, two, three, that's a rum bum exactly. Yeah, that's it. A G F sharp G. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. In G major, <laughs> G major, I'll get the score out. Yes, you can. Yeah, it's tough, right? Those 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 trills are tough. So okay, here's a little exercise. Let me give you an exercise for this. When you have something like that, one thing you can try is, you know, you stay very close to the keys when you play. Or it really does sound better when we put that four there. Okay, the other thing is, of course, probably the reason why you hear sometimes when I play it, that last, the second A, we don't hear it. We have that problem. See that? That's because this one is played too low. So the higher. See, the piano can do it. It just needs to be lighter. The higher you are in the key, the better the note's going to repeat. Now, okay, the exercise. You're staying close to the keys. Lift the fingers that have finished played. That gets a more clear sound. So really, you, you practice this like this. Play the three, lift the four. Uh, play the two, lift the three. Play the three, lift the two. So the lifting of one finger, it makes the other finger play. It's kind of like there's little pulleys in the, in the hand that are doing this. It's kind of like one movement, the playing of one finger and the other finger going up. That makes it a little more crispy, more clear. You can also try, remember this exercise? Of course, you have this going a little in the front. Right? And if you do put that four, don't forget, it's in rotation with the thumb. Now you can try also pull the fingers towards you so you feel this part of your hand, the metacarpal. Like when you see a skeleton, the bones go far into the hand. So you pull like that. Or like you try to keep water in your hand in a bathtub, right? And you make a little thing there in your hand. So it's this kind of thing. You use that to pull the notes towards you like this, one at a time, and then like this. And it really makes a difference. You'll find you have that drip from the keys along with all the technical movements which are played in the front, right? So that's really helpful. Pull the keys towards you. Uh, let's go on here. Okay, we're at that A flat major spot with the pedal. Thanks for that, Jacob. Happy, happy to hear some people are, are playing this piece. Right, so now, open pedal, he writes. <laughs> Very experimental things, and who knows what kind of effect that had on the pianos that Haydn had. But one thing I find really cool here, you can leave the pedal. It's a little bit messy, but we'll pianissimo. Flurry. And then when you get here, it's super clear. So that, that can be a nice effect. If you don't want to leave the pedal all the way, you could change it a little bit, shake it a little bit. You know, it'll have more of the effect of Haydn's piano, which didn't sustain notes that long anyway. effect when we go from that really blurry kind of thing here and then this C all by itself actually could do that better exactly the way it's written with the silences lift the D lift the C and remember that thing we had a little more a little less a little it with a metronome you got to practice it with a metronome because there's going to be places that you speed up there's probably one of them i think everyone speeds up here and you don't realize it you put the metronome on you feel like you're slowing down so it's important to use that now the 
crescendo starts, right? So look at that, we have group it this way. should be separated. Right? Probably we have to control to not be too loud here. Yeah, only one F. And I think uh, the the part that's coming up is a little bit uh, more angry sounding than this part. Yeah, it's just like, right? Very... back into here a piano this sounds kind of normal to our ears but I think in Haydn's time it's it's avant-garde we'll have some of that in the third movement Haydn's time, that's like really far out there, yeah? No one's doing that. <laughs> so we have a similar thing here. in there even though it's angry sounding E minor Here I, this is kind of like you know when the, he's angry and running and then a little bit out of breath it's kind of like that you know important to hear also the the two triplets and the six so you have that four up and then the way of connecting that a little bit i think that's nice otherwise you would do something like this also interesting Diminuendo, very contrasting. Now there's our. It's a joke because we think he's angry, but we're going to T major, and we don't know. You know, the listener doesn't know. Pretending to be mad now, right? And then he just starts right again like that. It's also kind of funny, right? Now a little different. We have I think I forgot that when I played it. So here's our recap. And now a little variation on the beginning. nice idea here is to do these in decrescendo and we want to show that one the first beat of that bar just like in the beginning of the piece I love them as well. Uh, 
stretch it. Forte in parenthesis, right? Or nothing if you're using, I think, the Wiener Urtex edition. So this doesn't have to be yum, yum, hum. It doesn't have to be loud like in the beginning. It could be soft. And see how you can play very energetically without necessarily being loud. This is really diabolical, but you know, you could always just take that note with the left hand. That's really, that's much easier, you know, otherwise, <laughs> I love doing it that way, but I still have a hard time. All right, we looked at that, the forces of gravity in the beginning. When you, this kind of thing, you can really hear Beethoven's, not Beethoven's influence, but Haydn's influence on Beethoven. You know, Haydn was Beethoven's teacher, for those who didn't know. Haydn taught Beethoven in, in, in Vienna, probably a very big influence on Beethoven. Now this is like a music box, you know, uh, the music boxes are, are invented in, I think, Switzerland uh, around this time, right? And Haydn is, I think, familiar with them uh, because he keeps doing these kind of music boxes. So you know those little things that you wind up in and it plays a tune? Sometimes you can even play it backwards. So we have that here. Right? That's a really music box kind of thing and it's so beautiful. Now you have this thing again in the A major sonata. In the second movement, there's a kind of music box piece that's written. It's called Minuet uh, al Rovesio, I think. In a minuet in reverse. Uh, and you read it front ways, and then you read it backwards, and it sounds beautiful. Even the playing it backwards is the most beautiful uh, of the two. We're going to look at that sonata in a few weeks. The A major, hold it in 1626, I think. All right, so this music box, again, you need to try to get this sound, as I always say, squeeze the belly button into the spine so you remove some weight from the instrument. You'll find it, put the una corda on. You'll find it much easier to get that pianissimo sound. And then stay high in the key. So you attack high in the key. Again, it doesn't mean that you don't hit the key bag. It's just that... The speed of attack, the moment that where you create the sound is high in the key. Again, open pedal. And we can really play with the with the pedal here because without the pedal, you know, we already have very interesting suspensions here. You'll get that A, that C is. It's so beautiful. It's really an amazing part of, of this piece. So, and right after contrasting with. the last time we have it so isn't that nice we'll have just have the closing theme go. which by the way it's almost the reverse of the of the theme yeah so here's the last time he plays it on a music box we exit 
basement music box land here. Group this together. And then group this. We're going down. Now we go up. We're going down. While going up. And now the opposite. We're going up while going down. Another musical joke I can sing. Also do two four one three two four one three maybe you jump five four four that works or you do the five three and come back to this a few ways of doing it same as we had in the beginning. satisfied the way it comes out. That's pretty good. So I find it helps a little bit if you feel that beat. You feel the second beat without putting an accent on it. The one in the left hand. So you have satisfied with it. That's the idea. Again. Show those curves. Short, short. Uh, don't leave the last chord long. Right? That's another thing that I think, okay, everyone's going to do something like that. He wrote it that way because that's the way he likes it. Why not leave it that way? It just sounds so good, you know? Maybe those are too short. Just keep them the same. It's really satisfying when these things are the same. Okay, one thing we didn't talk about that I'd like to is this thing here. That's kind of complicated. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Playing classical music uses less pedal. Romantic uses lots of pedal. Definitely, Bill. There's, there's less pedal in, in classical music. The notes, exactly as you said, didn't you say that it's more speaking? Every note speaks, did you say that? Cla emphasizes every note. Yeah, emphasizes. I like to think of it as a speaking thing. Like every note is a syllable, is a word in, in classical music. In romantic music, like take Rachmaninoff, that's not the case, right? You have like all this fluff around a melody. You know, you have like a simple melody with a whole bunch of notes. It would be like, you know, in, in classical you have... And 
in the Rachmaninoff, let's say you have... Something like that, you know? So <laughs> it's, in, that, in that sense, it's very different, right? You have that, that situation where every note is speaking in classical music. And even if you have, let's say, it's all a C major, you don't want to leave the pedal because now the notes don't really speak. Well, every note is kind of like Bach, you know? And even then, you know, we've talked about that a lot. You can still use the pedal in Bach as long as if no one can tell you're using it. That's great. So, so yeah, less pedal, and, you, and when you do, you change it more often, definitely. Uh, love musical Joe saw a video of a music box of a Haydn performance ah what is that I'm curious a music box of a Haydn performance of a piece by Haydn it was super fast someone was playing that hi, hi skark plug is it okay if perhaps maybe you could check out my latest YouTube video <laughs> Okay, we'll see about that. You can actually start uh, look at my uh, look at the link on the Patreon page because that's it. That's exactly what we're doing there on, on Patreon right now. You might want to check that out. Um, all right, okay, Matt, Matt. Hi, Matt. When can we expect to see a stream on Schubert? Yeah, we can do a stream on Schubert. That's a good idea. I, I looked at the the things in the schedule for everyone who's uh, wondering what we're looking at. You know, you can look at the schedule in the description and. Uh, all of the future live streams, usually on Mondays and Fridays, they're there with the repertoire we look at. So, uh, yeah, it would be good to have a little Schubert in there. That would be cool. Do you have absolute pit, uh, pitch? Uh, I, I don't. I have a good, a really good relative pitch. So, you know, it depends on the instrument. On the piano, I could, I could tell, but it's not like lightning fire. Like I hear a note and immediately I know exactly what it is. It takes me a few seconds. So. I don't think that's perfect pitch. Apparently not. <laughs> um, it was a music box supposedly from his time of a performance. Really? Oh, that's really cool. I'm going to check that out because uh, that music box thing in the A major sonata is so cool. It's really, really something. So, okay, guys. Nice. We kept it to under an hour. I thought this would be a little longer. So there, there we have it, the Haydn Sonata. Maybe we'll look at the second and third movement. That would be cool. Let me know in the comments what you'd like to hear. Um, if you'd like to hear the second and third movement, uh, we can also do, you know, like several, several sessions on one piece. That's, that's cool. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you like the stream, check out the Patreon page. The Patreon is really cool. Uh, you know, we're having a cool interaction with some patrons on there who are sending me some things. I'm listening to them and giving them commentaries, free lesson after five months of being a patron. And, uh, and of course, the money is being used to invest in everything you're going to see in this video. It's going to fix the sound soon. I know that's a problem because we only have one not so good microphone right now. So I'm going to get a headset or a lapel mic uh, and a separate mic for the piano with a little soundboard. That is going to be, uh, I think, audio is going to be much, much better. So you'll see some improvements there. And okay, guys, <laughs> that's it. Hi to everyone who joined. We're just finishing the, wrapping this up. So uh, that's it for the hide and C major sonata. See you guys on Friday. I think we're looking at Chopin. Is that possible? What are we looking at on Friday? Live lesson schedule. Friday is, oh, Debussy, the girl with the flaxen hair. I can't wait. I love that piece. I love teaching that piece. It's so beautiful. Hi, piano man. So see you guys in the next stream, in the next video. Until then, peace out, happy practicing, take care.